once he showed me the, the fundamentals of it, I knew what I wanted to make it sound like when I do it. I'm from the era where if you copied somebody, you could get into a fight for being a biter. In 1984, a vinyl-obsessed 18-year-old in Prairie View, Texas, had an idea. Chris Martin, soon to be known to the world as DJ Premier, combined an encyclopedic knowledge of classic soul with a voracious appetite for learning and changed hip hop forever. As one half of the beloved duo Gangstar and the producer behind iconic tracks for Nas, The Notorious B.I.G., Jay-Z, and countless others, Premier has secured an undeniable spot on the rap producer Mount Rushmore. And it all started with one idea. Both of your parents are educators, and I'm curious, how did their professional life inform your career ambitions? My mother taught art, which was more what I leaned towards, but my father taught biology. Uh, he eventually became the dean of arts and sciences at my school. I went to an HBCU college, uh, Prairie View A&M University. They pushed everything to to being proud to be black, and, and but, uh, but love everybody. And that's, that's how I still carry myself out to this day. And you mentioned that your mom was uh, an art teacher. Did she sort of introduce you to creative space at a very early age? Definitely. Every day, her, as soon as we, from our hallway, which leads to our bedrooms, to our family room, as soon as you open the hallway door, she has an easel with a blank canvas and she's painting, playing her vinyl. She's every day painting. And she taught me in junior high. Then when I went to high school, she taught me there too. So everybody in our neighborhood, everybody had my mom as a teacher. The same thing with, with understanding records and stuff because she collected so much vinyl. Uh, she's the one that said, if you touch that, that part of the record with your fingers and I see fingerprints, I'm gonna whip your ass. <laughs> like that's where we're scared to, she said, you hold it like this, yep. you know? So that was the rule. My role model will always be my dad, God bless him. He was always cool in any situation. I'm talking about bad situations, good situations, and he always had a way to figure it out. And I used to just be like, man, I want to be as cool as him. And I'm pretty much as cool as him. <laughs> I understand one of your early mentors in music would go on to be the father of someone that many people watching the show might know, Travis Scott. Um, mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about your relationship with his dad and, and what he taught you about yeah. music? Um, Travis's father, Travis's real name is Jack Webster. Okay. Jock Webster, actually. And uh, his dad is Jock Webster Sr. We call him Jack. Jack's mom was my English teacher. <laughs> and then Jack has, has a brother and a sister. He has a brother named Travis and he has a sister named Sonora. They're literally across the street. As I got older, getting closer to almost junior high, we'd go over to the Webster's house anyway because they had a VCR. They were the first ones I knew with a VCR and they would tape Soul Train. And oh. I'd be like, yo, I could watch Soul Train over and over and over. <laughs> I'd go over there and Jack's playing the drums, like killing it. And he had a really dope drum set and Travis was playing the bass, um, which is two of my influences when I make beats to this day is my drums and my bass because of them. And I was like, yeah, again, can you, you can show me how to do that? Taught me how to play, started playing with them, jamming with them. Travis taught me how to play bass, started jamming with them. Next thing you know, I'm now taking that seriously. Once I got to that point of learning it and mastering it, that's when I started to apply that to what I do when it comes to music production. So yeah, it goes that far back. To that point, you represent a generation of rap artists who grew up in a time before rap music existed. Mm -hmm. Do you see a difference between yourself and your contemporaries and how you think about the music and how you approach the music versus the later generations who grew up in a world where rap was fully mature at that point? 
I was born in 66. So anybody from that generation all the way up to when rap started to evolve, you know, into hip hop culture, now you'll be like, oh, that's that old school stuff or whatever. But for us, we were enjoying what our parents were playing. And so all the records from Aretha Franklin to Curtis Mayfield to The Emotions, Minnie Ripperton, Barry White, Al Green, you know, everything Motown. Mm -hmm. All that stuff was like the the building blocks, you know, then it then it, then it, it, it moved up, uh, you know, Heat Wave, Main Ingredient, uh, Blue Magic, you know, Parliament was later, you know, I, I was a big James Brown fan. And, and then my mom was a concert buff. So she always took me to concerts or the whole family would go. We all saw Ike and Tina Turner together. Uh, we'd okay. always go see the Jackson Five because they would play at the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo. And they would come out on the convertible, uh, you know, either Cadillacs or Oldsmobiles. I've probably seen the Jackson Five at least six, seven times as a kid. Wow. Because they were the only group that we saw where Michael and Marlon looked like kids. You know, Jackie, T Jermaine and Tito looked a little older. But Marlon and Michael were like the same height and they just looked our age and to see them dance like that, the outfits they wore and the music they made, we were just like addicted to the Jackson 5. So you were born in 66, so you're about 14 years old when hip hop, mm -hmm. you know, happens on a national scale. Do you remember what that feeling was like the first time you heard, you know, I'm assuming it's Rapper's Delight. I was blown away already because my grandfather uh, is from, from the South, uh, lived in Brooklyn. Every summer, our routine was summertime, we're going to see all of our family. And he was in a jazz band and used to always show us pictures off of, of his uh, photo albums of everywhere he's been in the world. You know, he okay. was in World War II, but when he was in his jazz band, he's like, yeah, this is when I was in France and Germany. And his wife, Rooney, uh, who's my step uh, grandmother, she's always go, oh, Billy, you always got to show off all the places you've been. But for me, I was like, man, I want to do that. What was it like, you know, coming from Houston to be in New York City, and this is, I imagine, like 75, 76, as a kid? What was the city like and what was the energy? It was just always amazing because everywhere we'd go, I'd always see somebody stealing somebody's tires from their bike. And I was like, this is an amazing city. Like, <laughs> they just steal shit in broad daylight. <laughs> so for me, I was fascinated in that way. The, uh, my first hip hop bug was because I was very into video games and I was into pinball machines. After a game, my grandfather took me to Playland, which was very popular back in, in, in those days. in was in, in, in Street? Yep. We go to Playland and I would challenge people to play me in pinball because I was very good at it at that time. I go outside and hear music and there's these guys breaking and popping and doing their thing and the guy's got the big boom box and I'm looking at it, they got the fat laces. And I'm just like, why, where'd they get those big laces from? I'd like to get some, you know, and, and they, didn't look, they didn't look foreign. It just looked like something I wanted to be down with because I could identify with it. How are you from just outside of Houston, finding out about records or learning about like how the culture is evolving. My mother and I were really heavy into record shopping together. So every time I went with her, she'd always be like, okay, you get to pick, pick three records, three, three albums, or I'd buy 45s. And we did that on the regular. So I started having a nice collection where when my sister and them would go to house parties, they would ask me, can, can we borrow some of Chris's records? And I'd be like, no, unless I get to go. And it, they, I started being known for having the latest records because anything that was new and hot, I always just kept a, a, in tune to it. And, I, and my mom would buy them for me. I was just addicted to records. Just, I wanted to have everything. Do you remember when your interest moved squarely to hip hop? The Fresh Fest, it came to, uh, to Houston at Astro World. Uh, we saw Run DMC, Nucleus, Fat Boys, UTFO, uh, Houdini, Flash and the Furious Five, Dougie Fresh and the Get Fresh Crew with MC Ricky D. And go to, to see all of these different artists. It was like, I have to do this. My biggest advantage as a creative was meeting so many people that I dreamed of meeting, you know, from doing what I do, that appreciate my work. Meeting, you know, LL and Run DMC and Molly Maul, who's my favorite producer, and uh, meeting Chuck D from Public Enemy and 
Dre, you know, Ice Cube, meeting so many actors, producers, filmmakers, meeting Prince <laughs> and him saying that Step in the Arena is one of his favorite albums. I'm like, all right, I'm good. I'm curious, living down there, obviously, you know, with such limited access, how were you figuring out even just simple DJing stuff? I started off just knowing how to blend. Okay. I could really blend really fast, put two records on, and I could really get it to blend that quick and keep the party going. I didn't have any turntables. Friends of mine had the equipment. They would let me use theirs because I had the records. So that was like... Let, let me let me learn on your stuff. I'll bring the records to your parties. As I, I'm about to start my freshman year in college in 1984, man, they were doing a party outside the Memorial Center, which is our, one of our hangouts. And I see this guy, a little skinny guy with a shag in the back, like a jerry curl, but waves on the top. I'm sitting there like, who is this dude? And he's scratching five minutes of funk by Houdini. And he just keeps starting it over and starting it. And I just remember he kept going, now the party didn't stop till I walked in. Now the party, and I'm just like, like you know, like, I got to meet this guy. He was done. I was like, yo, who, who are you? He said, oh, I just, just started going to school here. And I was like, yo, will you teach me how to do that? He was like, come to my dorm room and I'll show you. And I would just practice in his dorm all the time. until Because once he showed me the, the fundamentals of it, I knew what I wanted to make it sound like when I do it. Yep. And... I'm from the era where if you copied somebody, you could get into a fight for being a biter. You know, it was that serious. Like, oh, don't you bit my style. And somebody would punch you in the face for biting a style. And that's what I still live from is that. So with him, I didn't want to do it the way he did it because he had a certain technique on how he used to scratch the record. And I started doing my own and that started making people say, man, this guy, you know, I wasn't DJ Premier yet, but you know, I was DJ Chris. Okay. <laughs> and then Waxmaster C. Then Waxmaster C. And then, uh, you know, obviously when I when I joined Gangstar, right before Stu Fine, the own Wild Pitch Records, like, you know, we don't like that name, Waxmaster C. And I'm like, well, I do. And he's like, nah, you, you know, see if you come up with something else. And that's what I told my mom. She said, why don't you make a list? Make a list on a piece of paper and narrow it down to which ones. You know, I had DJ Scratch and Cut. That DJ Platter, because I was like, nah, there's no Platter DJs out there. Just anything affiliated. At DJ Needle, Needle Drop, you yeah. know. And Premier was one of them. My mom looked at the list and was like, that's the one. She said, because it's not like a world premiere at a movie or something like that, but it's still like your first. And I called them back because back I still hadn't officially signed. I said, what about DJ Premier? They were like, that's it. When you go to college, you are a computer science major. Mm -hmm. What were you thinking you were gonna do? That was more to really, really to please my dad. Um, as far as computer science, I mean, I just wanted anything that was close to elect anything electrical. Because okay. since I was already good at taking things apart and and uh, doing, you know, installing everybody's car stereos, I, I was into drilling it precise and not even using a measuring, uh, uh, using a ruler. I could just fi figure it out. I figured that was the closest thing to, to that I would have to fall back on. But it's crazy because all the languages I learned, Fortran and COBOL and BASIC, none of them even exist anymore. But I figured once I graduate, I'll get a job and all of that stuff. But then I met this MC that came to my school a year later as well. His name is uh, Theodore Campbell. We call, he called himself Top Ski. Okay. And he's always be like, yo, I can use that mic. And I would just start playing. I might be playing a break beat or something. And he would just get on the mic. And then he'd be like, yo, I can get on the turntable. And I'm like, you know, I'll scratch. He'd get on and start doing stuff. And I'm like, wow, this guy's good at everything. And now we became a, a, a team. And then we had two more, another MC named Sugar Pop. And we had a dancer that was like a like a Flavor Flav. His name was Styly T. And we we, we became the uh, MCs in control. My biggest early supporter was definitely my mom. She's like, baby, if you're gonna go to New York and do this, make sure you go all the way in, but I know you are gonna make a name for yourself. And my father said the same thing. He said, make sure they know who you are and not just in New York, all over the world. Mission accomplished. I understand you worked at a record store while you're in college. 
But somehow, in a pre-internet age, you end up making a demo that makes its way from Houston all the way to Stu Fine mm -hmm. of Wild Pitch Records yeah. office. How does that happen? When I got the job at the, uh, it was called Sound Waves, the most popular store in Houston if you really, really want to find what you're looking for. Carlos was the 12-inch buyer. Carlos Garza, right? Yes. Didn't know Carlos yet when I just started going. We got cool. He was bugging that I knew so many records from New York. And I was like, well, man, I could tell you what's hot in New York because I had all the mixtapes when I would go. Uh, not the mixtapes. I was taping the, the mix when I would go to New York going back and forth. So you're just taping the radio? Yeah. Taping Red Alert, Chuck Chill Out, and Marley Mall with Mr. Magic and just bring those back. And I'd be like, this is uh, The Bridge by MC Shan. He would find it, order it, and he would get the 12-inch. He's like, man, you got you know so much. I'll see if I can get you a job here. I was like, I'd love to work here. Once he got me a job there, he became, uh, Billboard was just starting a rap chart. So Carlos became the reporter for that region of, of the South to report what's popping and what's selling. Stu Fine, the own Wild Pitch Records, was calling to see how are my records moving. Carlos says, man, there's this guy that's coming to New York. You really got to check out, man. He got, he's, he's like different. And Stu was just like, tell him to contact me. He heard our demo. He said, I like you. I don't like your MC. Then they had Gangstar, Chill Rob G, and La T at the time, and they wanted me in Gangstar. I was gonna say, you, although you are synonymous with Gangstar, you actually were part of the third iteration of the group. Mm -hmm. We were good, because we were called MCs in Control. I don't know why we changed our name to the Inner Circle Posse. <laughs> this is you and Top. Yeah, well, me, Top, Sugar Pop, and, uh, okay. and Styly, but then as it came to making the demos, the demo that went to, to New York was just me and Top. And Stu was like, his voice is just not working. I'm gonna put you on a real studio. You do the exact same demo. And if I like Top, I'll be interested in possibly signing him. He did it in a real studio, real mics. And he was like, nope. Guru was looking for a new DJ at the time because the other two members were having it out and then not coming to stay in New York and struggle it out. So he's like, well, Gangstar is my name and Big Suge's name because they created Gangstar. Guru was like, yo, we got to get Premier. I was like, if I can't bring Top, I'm not going to do it. Got to a point where Top was just frustrated with how long it was taking. And he said, man, I'm going to the, to the military. And I, I was there when the, the recruiting officer came and got him. So now that he's gone, I called Stu and say, hey, man, uh, <laughs> Top just went to the military for four years. And I'm by myself. He's like, we want you in Gangstar. Moving to New York to join Gangstar, Premier set out to learn production and eventually perfected a sound that would garner him a level of acclaim unsurpassed by any producer in rap history. But as his star shone increasingly bright, attracting collaborations with the biggest names in rap, his Gangstar partner Guru would pursue life outside of the group before tragedy would ultimately end the Gangstar era forever. You join Gangstar, and now you and Guru are partners. Mm -hmm. Up until that point, you knew what it was to be a DJ. You knew you wanted to be a part of the scene. Mm -hmm. It was all enthusiasm and yeah. just like, what I'll just figure it out, whatever it is. Yeah, because Guru said, you're not getting half of the money if you're just going to scratch on the albums. You got to learn how to either produce it. And I was like, well, what does a producer actually do? He said, you do the tracks and mix it. And I'm like, what's mixing? Me and Guru started to build with each other and we, we did the first album together. I didn't know how to make beats sharp yet. So it was me, Slomo Sonnenfeld, uh, who, who owned the studio, Such a Sound. And uh, we, the three of us would be on the SP 1200. You know, I'll be like, yo, I'll do the snare. And we'd be side by side and I'll go, ta, ta, and I'll go, yo, yo, hit that, hit that. And, and, and Guru will hit the, and, and we'd be like, yeah, that sounds good, high five. Slow more, <laughs> you do the 808. Boom, 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 listen back. All right, just lay that down. That's how we did the first album, if no more Mr. Nice Guy. I haven't seen Slow Mo in over 20 something years, probably 25 years. And I told him I was coming to Israel to do a gig. Yeah, and he took care of us. We went all over the town, had good food, went digging at the record store. And Slomo was like, man, remember the first time you wanted to fight me when you came in because you brought your turntables and a coffin 
And I thought in the studio, you set it up and do it like the way we did the four track demos. And Slomo was very cocky and he'd be like, you don't need that thing right now. You don't need that, you know. Uh, you, you can set that up later. I'm like, what, who the f you talking to? Man, I'm setting my up now. And Guru's like, that's not how it goes in the studio. You can <laughs> lay the tracks down. You can do your scratches last. I'm like, oh, you know, I didn't know. Once I started to understand the process of making records, now I'm like, okay, let me start to really hone in on learning everything, mixing. If I want to do an echo there, or I want to do a delay here, what's doing that? And I was like, I gotta have a sound that's my sound. And I started working on my sound. Come to 92, when we did Daily Operation, that's when I was like, I got a sound. Because King of Chill used to let me come to his mom's house to learn it. He was like, I got one that you can learn on, but you gotta bring your own drum machine. So I bought a little or less's drum machine, and he would just let me practice on it. And then I finally started to tap out with the beats to the way I was like, I'm I'm definitely got it now. The last beat I ever made at his his mom's house was X-Girl to Next Girl. Oh, wow. I was like, check out this beat. I think this is going to be a hit. Played it for him, and then it was one of our biggest hits off of our career. Did you sit down and talk about how the business was going to work or like how you guys were going to function, you know, what the economics of it were going to be or, or any of that kind of stuff? The fact that we were both college educated and both, uh, you know, grew up with our parents, we already knew the basics of how to balance a check account, checking account. We both uh, shared a, the same bank account until we parted ways at, in like 2004 and, and he wanted to do his own thing. But prior to that, we've always had the same, same account. You guys obviously go from being perfect strangers to now, you know, in a group and then roommates mm -hmm. within a few months. Yeah. And, you know, uh, obviously, there comes to be friction anytime, you know, you're in a creative partnership like that, particularly when you're sharing space on top of that. We lived together from 1988 to 1994 when Hard to Earn dropped. That was the first time we finally got our own cribs. And, That's crazy. And at that time, Guru had three and five cars, you know, <laughs> so okay. uh, we, you know, we, we were, all, and we were not making millions and we were still just that comfortable with how we, how we did our thing and had a massive crew with us you know, loaning them money and taking care of everybody at the bar and all that type of stuff. In my career, what have I learned from my biggest mistake? Um, being good to too many people that ain't good to you in return, you know. Financially, friend-wise, it just goes with the territory. The only thing is just get those scissors and cut them off and keep it pushing. When the press talked about you, people tried to put you in a, a little bit of a box as a group, and it became like, oh, they're like jazz rap or something mm -hmm. like that. How did you guys internally think about that when you started seeing people kind of trying to brand you in that way? And, and did you, you know, did you make moves to consciously move, move out of that? Guru hated that label. He hated it. I did too, but, um, for him, he hated it because he was like, man, I want the streets to love us. And I was like, they already do. He's like, yeah, but I, I, they keep calling us jazz rap. And he said, jazz rap is rapping about jazz, like saying, and hear the horn coming down, and hear the drummer. You know, he said, that's jazz rap. We're talking about shit that's going on, who's going to take the weight, and just to get a rep. And, you know, and, and that, even that was based off of him getting robbed. And we and the guy died uh, in a in a, in a, in a car chase with us chasing after him with the police. The guy dies, hits an ice cream truck and passes away and Jeez. on impact. Next day we did the record. So the jazz rap thing got to him so much that I was like, you know what? When we do, it was going all the way to daily operation. Hard to earn, I stripped everything down purposely to not even have any jazz samples except for mostly the voice which is an upright bass sample, but I started using space sounds and weird, just galactical stuff, just anything to stray away to show that we're good on any sound that we that we put out there and create. In that, that period of 88 to say 94, hip hop music is changing radically every six months, nine months. Mm -hmm. And and I'm, I've always been curious how artists like yourself in that moment 
were able to be in front of the trends. How were you guys staying on top of things and sort of forecasting the way that the sounds were going to change, you know, tempos, all that? For us, we were really out there keeping up with everything happening. I mean, we were really addicted to going out. <laughs> you know, Guru, I mean, he had to go out all the time. He's never like, oh, I'm a chill this weekend. That's just how he is. And everybody that knows him, you're bored and 20 other friends don't don't want to go don't want to go nowhere. Call him. He's going. Yeah, where are we going? We were really in, into everything. Same thing when we met Biggie. Mr. C lived down the block from us. He used to stress me to listen to his Biggie demo tape, and I was like, yeah, 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 and kind of brush him off. See Mr. C again. Yo, and you know what I'm talking about and C can have an attitude. Yo, Biggie Smalls, man. I, I'm like, all right, all right. Maybe three days later, Guru's like, yo, you got to hear this guy Biggie Smalls down the block. He's dope. I'm going to freestyle with him. I'm like, where is he at? And he's on Fulton and Washington. All right, I'll go with you. Shug is with us. Dab is with us. Lil' Kim's there. We don't, you know, we don't even know she's rapping. And Nino and Chico and uh, Clep, everybody. And Biggie's out there just rhyming. And he's already a big Gangstar fan. And and that's how we all got cool. Way before he even had a record. You know, uh, Party and Bullshit hadn't even been out yet. And that was now our new hangout. We don't go hang out with Big. Chub Rock lives in our neighborhood. Lady of Rage, that's how I met her. And she, and she got frustrated with not getting a deal uh, and getting nothing popping in New York. She said, I'm going to see if I can find Dr. Dre. I'm like, yeah, okay. We have a Gangstar show at the Palladium on Sunset Boulevard. And she goes, yo, I found Dr. Dre and he's signing me to this new label called Death Row. And I'm like, Death Row? She's like, yeah, he just started a brand new label. And I'm on the list. She said he got an album called The Chronic coming out. And you're going to see me on there. Around the time of Hard to Earn, your career starts to go through a bit of a metamorphosis. You do the records on Illmatic, the records on Ready to Die, then solo works with the Gangstar Foundation guys, with J. Ru and Group Home, and then kind of capping with Reasonable Doubt, Jay-Z's debut. I feel like that really elevated you relative to where you were, both with your competitive peers at the time, but also even within the group. And I'm curious, did that run of records change the dynamic between you and Guru at all, um, or how things operated within the group? I want to say yes and no, but the fact that he was cool with everybody, so he was never hating on them. Okay. You know, so he never had a problem with Big J, Nas, anybody. But Guru's main complaint, uh, again, was just, he always felt like I was getting more accolades than he was. And I was always like, yo, everybody loves you just as much. It's like, no one's like, oh, yeah, we only like Premier, not you. And I said, and, and you're not, and obviously this is pre social media era, where are you getting that from? Really, anytime we would fight over stuff, it'd be nonsense. But one thing I was always good at, I don't want to call myself like a psychiatrist or anything, but I always knew, talk him down off the ledge, and just be like, dude, it's going to be all right. Everything's going to be fine from fights he's getting there with people to people that would do disrespectful things to him outside of when I wasn't around. I'd be like, yo, I'll take care. Everything was always, I'll take care of it. Was that hard to, I mean, you guys are, you know, in an, this committed relationship as, as you know, business partners, as creative partners, mm -hmm. and, and you're living together. And, you know, how did you sort of deal with that and, and yeah, navigate it? I loved what we had. The gangstar relationship and our re and, and we were consistent with records. Every album was consistent. Every album was successful. I, I love what we had, and he loved what we had. So we don't want to break that up. And it, it just through all those fights, and we had many. We'd always go back in the lab and make heat and and laugh. And then I was always saying to people, "How can we make that many albums and do that many tours as successfully if we really hated each other? You can't do it." It was you more know. like brothers and just... Yeah, so it, was, it definitely wasn't a friendship. It was definitely a brotherhood. Definitely brothers. Is it true that Now Your Mind was a, a sub at you? Yep. Yep. 
We got into a big fight. And I had food poisoning, so I was really, really, I was throwing up so much. He was having an argument with somebody in our house. He got violent. I'm trying to separate him, but I'm weak, but I'm strong enough to hold him, you know, but when he's when he's really mad, he's strong, man. He's like, get off, you know, like really get off of me. I'm holding him, I'm like, dude, I'm gonna let you go, but you better not hit me because I'm just, I'm out of breath. I'm so weak. He goes, all right, I'm cool. I let him go. We're still breathing heavy and he just uppercuts me. I'm talking about catches all of this. And I just said, motherfucker, and I, there was an iron. I just remember swinging it, boom, 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 just like just swinging it uncontrollably because I'm just blacking out now because I really cannot handle anymore because I'm that weak. But I just remember the blood shooting out his head and it's shooting out so much that it's running down his face. And I swear to God, that DMX cover, flesh of my flesh, blood of my blood, every time I see that cover, I think of goo because that's what he looked like. Now, now I caught myself like, oh my God, now I'm trying to stop the blood. and we're, I'm holding him, I'm like, we gotta go to the hospital. From there, they sew him up and White Man Can't Jump was about to come out, but they were doing a hip hop soundtrack as well. And they had just paid us, you know, I think it was like 40 grand, which was a big deal back then, to do one song. And they were like, you gotta record it tomorrow because it's due. And we didn't know the fight was gonna happen. Uh, they said, if you if you don't want to do it, just give him the money back. He said, nah, I'm gonna do the song. <laughs> we go to D&D. He said, turn all the lights on. And he just looked at me and just said, yo, dude, you're dead wrong. You never had the skills like mine. I write the ill-type rounds now, reach them up. And he just looking at me. And while, and while the beat's playing, I'm just looking at him and he's just looking at me, one take. And I remember when he's finished with it, he goes, are we good? I was like, yeah, we're good. He goes, and f you, and he just knocks the whole mic over and just storms <laughs> out of the building. But we got the take. <laughs> and now your mind's a classic. Crazy. <laughs> Do I ever get creatively blocked? Yes. Um, there's just time just not, it's just not working. Uh, from music to your life, your fa you know, your family, everything. But, uh, but the one thing I do is I never, ever quit. Never will you ever see me quit anything. Around 1996, you arrive at what I think most people think of as the premier sound, the, the peak and identifiable sounds that people associate with you. Mm -hmm. Like, was there a specific record that you made and you felt like, oh, this, like I've, I've unlocked the next level of what I do? Definitely a lot of stuff on KRS's album, Return of the Boom Bap. Definitely uh, Mass Appeal was a huge step into, you know, we, we do it differently than everybody else. And I know how to tap into what, you know, sound-wise, yeah, Mass Appeal was huge. You know, even the Biggie stuff, I mean, Unbelievable was me telling him I don't have time to do a record with you before, because he was like, I just need one more. I'm like, big, I don't have time, man. I said, I'll get you on the next album. And he was just like, yo, I don't care if it's in peace the president, just make me just something. I was like, you know what? Meet me at d and he came. I just had those funny, the one note, and I just tuned them to different keys and just started playing around with them. And he was like, yo, do that, do that. And uh, after it was all done, he was like, yo, you should take the R. Kelly when he says it's unbelievable, cut that. I'm like, man, it might not be in key. He said, just try it anyway. I did it, I was like, yeah, that shit fits. Turned it in, mastered it with Hit Factory and then boom. Had to be three days later, if that, and me and Gordon are driving back to Brooklyn and we hear unbelievable blasting in somebody's system. And I'm like, yo, we just did that three days ago and somebody's bumping it. With Gangstar, I've always found it really interesting the way that you guys put together your songs and your album titles. Can you tell me a little bit about that process? Guru makes a list uh, of the titles and we stick it on the wall. So before there's any album or anything? Any there's beat, a, yeah. There's yeah. A, a list of song titles. Man, he always titled the album. Hard to earn, he was like, you're gonna name the album. 
we were just having a conversation and I was like, man, what we do, it, 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 people don't realize, man, what we do is so hard to earn. He goes, that's the title right there. You just named it. He said, you're naming the next one. We were going through, both going through a rough time. He, I said, this should be called Moment of Truth. You're facing a five-year jail bid and I'm going through a lot of people that were dying in my life that was just having me off uh, off point with my, my thinking and just my, my, you know, how I was feeling. Mainly for him possibly going to jail because we kept, we were going through court while we were working on the record. <clears throat> that's why Moment of Truth, he was really going through the stress of facing that. So that's why that record is so powerful. And, uh, you know, it's our first gold album. That was another thing too. He used to tear the crib up about, man, we should, everybody's going platinum and gold and we should have been gold like everybody. That we just as good as them. I'm like, one day it's going to happen. <laughs> That, that's how, how calm I am. It's going to happen, man. The moment of truth goes gold. He was the happiest kid in the room. What are the qualities about your personality that you hold <clears throat> to the most tightly on your journey? For one, not being an ass. Um, I'm far from that. Everybody knows I'm very humble. It took me a long time to even want to be able to speak in, in interviews because Guru, God bless him, was always the one that loved the red carpet. I'd be like, I'm not doing a red carpet and sitting there going, look to the left, look to the right. He loves it. And I was like, you do it and I'll play the background. After years and years of playing that position of, of being in the background, I eventually got the courage to start to speak up. And, and not be afraid to talk in front of an audience and even on stage. But one thing everybody will tell you is I'm, I'm a cool dude. In that moment around life after death, you sort of achieve a status where anyone that wants to have an album that's considered a classic has to come to you for some heat. And that, you know, comes I think out of Jay, Nas, and Big all mm -hmm. sort of leaning heavily on you for some of the most important records on their classic albums. Up until when you guys put out the owners, there's a fairly linear continuity in the sounds of hip hop and coming from 88 through 2003 with, mm -hmm. you know, when Hove and 50 are on top. Right. In the six to eight years after that, you know, the center of hip, hip hop moves to Atlanta, sounds start to shift. You were obviously, you know, in your late 30s, early 40s around that time. Has your, did your relationship with the music go through any ups and downs or any changes in that time? Not at all. We kept still doing how we do it. Cause I'm a fan of music anyway. So I'm like, you know, if we supported you and what you do and we're, we're fans, keep feeding us stuff that we love. And, and because there's a lot of groups that just started coming with stuff. I'm like, oh, this ain't hot and you're disappointed. And I want you to anticipate that the next thing that we deliver is gonna be still what you expect from us. Yeah, yeah, like we said, it updates, but still it sounds like us. I feel like you still gotta sound like you. In the sort of late aughts, you stepped out and produced a record for Christina Aguilera. That is, you know, probably uh, one of the more high profile things that you've done in your entire career. It seems like she had a very specific vision and, you know, worked very closely with you in collaborating on that. You know, what did you learn from working on such a big pop record? Um, I definitely got to give a big shout to her, <clears throat> her ex-husband, uh, Jordan Bratman, because he put her on to me, Tribe, a few other artists. She was looking to do that type of a sound of an album and take it back to, to, to and go retro with that era. When I met her, I remember she's like, yo, I love the group home album. I'm like, group home, <laughs> you, you know? And she was like, yeah, I like this song. I like the Biggie record. I love these Gangstar records. You know, she was just naming them all off the head. And I remember when not every, people were finding out that I was about to work with her, like, ah, you're gonna sell out and do the pop thing. And I'm like, nah, it's not selling out. We're gonna do good records and it's gonna do what it do. We get a Grammy for the single. Crazy. You know? And I've gotten Grammys for albums, but to get one for a single, it hits different because it's like, it's just your song, <laughs> you get a Grammy. 
I tell a good idea from a bad idea just by how it hits me in my soul. If it doesn't hit me in my soul, no matter what the topic or situation, I'm going to make sure that I thumb it down or thumb it up. In 2010, Guru passes suddenly and at a fairly young age. Mm -hmm. And you guys were somewhat estranged in that in that moment. What was that like to receive that call and to sort of have to wrap your head around the end of this chapter of your life? Um, I remember Static Selector called me to say it was official. And I called Guru's sister, Trish, and she was like, it's not, we, we don't know that yet. You Let me find out and I'll call you back. How long had it been since you had spoken to him before that? Mm, our last tour ended like 2004. Shit, probably almost a good four years. Wow. Yeah, yeah, a good four years for sure. And even during that time, a lot of people outside that knew us both was like, uh, was like, yo, man, if we put y'all in the room so y'all could talk, are you down immediate? I'm like, yeah, I'm down. Just make it happen. I'm there. You know, was there a specific like point of friction that you fell out over, or or you just kind of? No, at that point he was just like, yo, I, I, I want to do other things. He never said Gangstar's broken up, and I stand. We we never have. You know, you'll see it in write ups, and it's like, he, and, and when you look at uh, interviews of him asking him about it, he never confirms it, and neither will I. But when it comes to him just saying, I want to do other things, you know, all right, cool. He was away from everyone, everyone, you know, except for his son. No communication with anybody. And we thought it was weird, you know, we thought it was strange. Even when he was running with his new partner, we thought that was strange because it's like, that's all we've done. We still have some type of communication. I'm not, I ain't got nothing against you and I'm not mad at you. And we don't know if he's mad at us. And uh, the best uh, situation with me Obviously, after that that, that long uh, stench of silence, was I got to see him in the hospital. When I go in there, I had brought my Gangstar shirt, just the traditional one with just the big logo on the front, and I brought the Moment of Truth CD. I look at his body to see if he's being taken care of. And everything's nails along. Everything's his hair is all messed. Up. You know, he, he always had a baldy. So now his hair, is, he looks like a 70s soul singer or something because the hair's all grown back, but it's just all clumpy. And I pull the covers back down to cover him up and the nurse walks in and catches me. And she's like, what are you doing in here? You're not supposed to be in here. And I said, ma'am, look, I show her the CD. Look, that's me and that's Guru. I said, look. And she goes, we've been hearing so many things about this guy, but we give you five minutes to be alone with him, and then you gotta go. I was like, that's all I need. And then that's when I took the shirt, I had it rolled up, and in my in my back pocket, kind of like a towel, unraveled it, <clears throat> laid it across his chest. I was like, yo, this is forever. You know, you live for this. This is forever. And I just laid it on his chest for a minute, took it back off, stuffed it all the way under his, his mattress. You know, even though it's tilted up a little, and they'll probably find it or whatever and maybe throw it away, I don't know. And then I put the uh, the CD under there too and stuffed it just, you know, f deep enough to where even if they change the sheets, they may not ever find that. I kissed him on his, on, right on by his mouth, even with the crusty lips and everything, you know, and, and uh, just say, I love you and we, we, we got you, we got your son, we got, we're gonna make sure he's good. After the death of his estranged best friend and musical partner, Premier regrouped and teamed with another rap veteran, Royce the 5'9", on a new project that tapped into the history of the genre with a fresh context. Now an elder statesman, Premier is both a guardian and guide to the past, but still committed to forging the future of hip hop with each new beat that he makes. A few years after Guru passes, you form a new group with Royce. And I was always curious, you know, you obviously had worked with Royce for 12, 13 years at that point, off and on on many projects of his. Mm -hmm. What was it that inspired you to not produce an entire Royce album, but instead to form a group with Royce? I, I know you know Mike Haran. Of course. Uh, Mike had uh, pitched this idea 
it was during them working on Slaughterhouse, but they were taking so long to get all that process done. Mike had pitched, why don't y'all, he was handling Adrian Young at the time, I guess on the side. And he was like, you know, how about y'all do a project like a quick EP of Slaughterhouse where you use Adrian Young's sound on, you can't sample no other records, just Adrian Young's music. I was very against it. I was like, nah, I like to dig and make beats through digging. Everybody's leaning on me about it. And it just went silent. Time passed. Royce hits me again and goes, what if me and you did it? And I was like, let, let me get in touch with Adrian. And we got in touch. He gave me all his catalog, started listening to stuff. Cause Adrian was like, I'm gonna give you all the stems so you can just pick instruments. And I was like, nah. I want the way your songs were so that I could do it like if I'm sampling a record I dug and found. Royce was just getting over being sober, so he hadn't rapped in a long time. And for me knowing the the drunk, not sober Royce, his bark and his delivery is always just on point. Sometimes if you sober up, I'm glad that you're sober because the most cleanest, the healthy lifestyle is the best. But that doesn't mean that you're gonna still pull off the, the the Royce that we all know and love. I had already made three beats I gave him and he said, I'm gonna work on them and, and let you hear what I did, see if you like where I'm going because I haven't rapped in so long. The, the song prime is for is what he sent. As soon as I turned it on and it said, dun, 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 he goes, gather round, gather round. Just that, just that, I'm like, he's back. And I listen to the rest of it just another day in my reformed life. I'm like, ooh, he sound like when he drinks, but he's sober. I call him, dude, you're back, you're back. He's like, man, you for real? I'm like, yes, that's the Royce I was hoping to hear. Let's get this album cracking. He goes, yo, how about we call ourselves a name like a group? And instead of it being DJ Premier and Royce to 5-9, I was like, you got a name? He goes, yeah, because the song was called Prime, P-R-I-M-E. Um, he goes, how about we call ourselves Prime, but we spell it different. The P and the R is capital. The P is for Premier, the R is for Royce, and H-Y-M-E just encompasses everything of hip hop and all that together. I was like, I like that. And then he said, so from now on, we are Prime. And that's, what, that's how I was, I was birthed. That record was also really interesting to me because it was, and you mentioned the, the use of the Adrian Young music, I, I, I felt like that was a moment of real change in how your beat sounded. Yeah, only for prime. I, yes. You know, that, that, which we say in every interview, um, I only do that where we take one sound source and do it for prime. Anything outside of that, I'm back to digging and yep. sampling and all that stuff. but. That's that's how that came about. And then with Prime 2, we were gonna use Adrian again, but we didn't have enough catalog to really take it where I wanted to take it. So I was like, maybe we should just change it and make it a different person every time. That makes it even special. And then the Ant Man Wonder was the next one that Mike was dealing with mm -hmm. and we, we, we got with him. So, which I, I love Prime 2. Yes. Prime 3 is a doozy. We're gonna see that soon? Oh yeah, that one we're not gonna announce until it's done, but okay. yeah, then you're definitely gonna be like, oh shit, okay. Do I ever doubt myself? Honestly, no. Even if I fail, I still don't doubt myself. I believe in myself, but I, the, the failures have happened. <laughs> <laughs> so Travis Scott's father teaches you how to play drums. Mm -hmm. I have to ask, how did you become aware of Travis and his musical ambitions? Actually, uh, Sonora, we call her Vivi. Uh, Vivi brought, her, brought him to my parents' house. Again, it's right across the street. When I heard the demos that he had at the time, I, I, I wasn't really into that lane, but I know that somebody like Kanye would be. And I didn't know that he had a meeting coming up with Kanye and Vivi called me and said, hey, let me know if, uh, if if he's making the right move for Kanye as he's gonna have a meeting coming up and I just wanna make sure he's not getting jerked around. I was like, I'll call Ye and let him know that he's family. Called Ye and said, hey, this guy's coming up. He's family, his dad taught me everything, blah, blah, blah. And Ye was like, all right, next thing you know, he's signing, you know, Ye got him hooked up. 
From the outside looking in, it felt like probably around 2015, your brand started activating in a much more deliberate and sort of consistent way. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you've had placements every year, you know, for 30 years. Right. But with merch drops and now doing the So What's Up uh, video series and really sort of hitting different notes at different times, but with a consistent cadence. I'm curious, you're now 57 years old. What are the things that you want to accomplish in you know the next chapter of your career? I've always loved scoring. Um, it's just a, just a thing of mine that I've always wanted to do just from watching movies and Man, the way they put that track right there, and you know, I've done the breaks. You know, shout out to Dan Charnis for uh, letting me drive, steer that wheel, and um, you know, I've done stuff for the last OG with Tracy Morgan. He hit me up, you know, I need you to do season two, and stuff like that. And um, but you know, I've always wanted to get to the motion picture level just because of all the old, um, you know, movies like the Mac soundtrack and. Um, Cleopatra Jones and uh, Foxy Brown movie and with, with Willie Hutz doing the whole album. That's a big dream of mine. And uh, I always wanted to do a cartoon too, kind of based on our, our journey of how we live life as, as entertainers, since I could speak on it based off of everything, you know, from the groupies to the drugs to everything, I could speak on it and and it'll be, even if you didn't live that life, it's relatable in your life in some type of way. And if it's not relatable in that way, uh, the people that are living it from athletes to actors on down to anybody in the entertainment world would be like, yo, yep, he's right. And and it's, there's so many people that, that do it already, but I still know how to do it from a view where it's like, yo, Preem's version is dope. You know, I'm very into making sure if it's coming from me, it's gotta be dope, so. You, you mentioned Prime 3. Are, are there any other, you know, obviously, uh, in the last few years, collaborative albums between a single producer and a single MC have become, uh, you know, a uh, sort of consistent wave. Do you have any uh, ambition to do that kind of thing? And are there any artists that you have on your short list? Yeah, I'm doing a few things now. Uh, I, I've always, I wanted to go back to this one producer type of projects because, you know, it's funny now when you go do an interview, they're like, yeah, so who all you got on your album? Back in our era, it wasn't that. It was just like, new album out, singles hot. Uh, we're gonna get into the the second single. They were like, they were never, never asking who all the producers you got and, and what features. Now that's always the number one thing. Will we ever get the Nas premiere album? That's a Nas question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hey, he said it on 30. He, For me, I, that was just might, still might happen. <laughs> so that, that that's better than nothing. Okay. And he said it, not me. Cool. <laughs> what up, Vesco? I was gonna say that one thing that has really changed, you know, obviously you are a man of vinyl, but we live in the streaming era. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, that's done so many interesting things, both in terms of taking all the barriers down so everyone can listen to everything. Mm -hmm. Anyone that wants to make music can get their stuff on the platform. Now, I just, this happened two days ago, I was looking on Spotify and I looked at MF Doom's page. He has five records that have 100 million streams each. There's not one chorus between the five records. <laughs> and I'm like, this is such a beautiful and incredible time for music mm -hmm. because there aren't rules anymore. I love doing my radio show. You know, I was on Sirius for a long time. I'm about to start back up again, breaking records from the underground. It's the best because it reminds me of Red, you know, Hang Love DNA, the Awesome Two, uh, Mr. Magic Rap Attack. Hearing all these records, like, what is that? What is that? And what is that? And you start looking for those records. And they usually already had them at the record store. You just didn't know because until it got broken. And uh, I'm going to start back up doing my thing because just breaking records is fun and posting my list and people posting it on the gram going, yo, Preen played my record. I don't even know a lot of these people, but the record is good and I break it. Do you have to work to keep that, that joy and that passion? That, that fan that was a young kid, that fan that was in junior high, that fan that was in high school, college, and finally got a record deal to do it my, the way we wanted to do it. And, 
and actually got successful doing it the way we said it should be done like this, still that way. And I don't even wonder like, damn, am I ever gonna stop loving it? I always say you can't outgrow a culture. That's why, you know, when I'm like, damn, 57 and I'm still like <laughs> about to cook up another one. It's, it's fun, it's still fun. I love the challenge.